I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. We are now only a week and so away from Gen Con, but hey, there's still lots of great stuff coming your way. There's a lot of fun reviews we did last week, but there's a couple of things. First of all, I want to remind you about the Dice Tower Cruise. Time is not getting any farther away. Dice Tower Cruise in December. If you want to make sure you have a spot on a board, a boat where you're playing games with a lot of people, then you need to sign up now. Find that at DiceTowerCruise.com. Also, a lot of people have been asking us about t-shirts. Well, our t-shirt uh, company that we were working with, unfortunately, went out of business. They're no longer in existence. So we have made a deal with Geeky Goodies. This is from Chris Cormier. And we have a few shirts on there now. This is our new logo that shows the dice. So I got myself and Sam and Z on the two different sides of me. There's a logo and we have more logos and things that will be coming. We started with a few shirts. They are available as of today. Now these shirts, some of the money goes helping the Dice Tower. This is a very minute money maker for us. We basically just put these up so that if you want to get a shirt, you can do so. And so they're available now. With that being said, let's get to the news. Okay, so first in the news, we have Arcane Tinman has decided to no longer work with Asmodee uh, for the distribution in North America. Uh, and this is partially because Asmodee made an exclusive deal with Alliance. Uh, Arcane Tinman makes the card game Spoils and also has Dragon Sleeves. Probably they're more well known for that. And so this is interesting. Will we see other companies split from Asmodee in the future? I'm not sure that exclusive arrangements are really good for the hobby, but I don't know. It's just an interesting thing to me. Uh, also on an interesting thing list, Target has announced that there's 50 new exclusive games these were supposed to be in stores last Sunday. I was in Target on Sunday, they weren't there. I went back Tuesday, they weren't there. So I've given up for a while, <laughs> but maybe they'll be there soon. It's a big long list, a lot of them aren't that good, but some of them are pretty cool. Of course, this has caused a lot of outcry amongst retail stores. We're saying it's not fair that Target has these exclusive games, even though they don't complain as much when they get exclusive games over the online stores. Uh, Quinted has announced their next big box game. Quinted makes a lot of really cool games. This one is Agra. It's a game based in India. And if you look at the components here, they look really cool. We'll know more information about this game as we get closer to Essen. Stonemaier Games is talking about some stuff that's coming out. Of course, Charterstone is the huge release. Everyone's pumped about. This game is a legacy style game. He's announced that there's like stickers, extra stickers included with the game or reusable stickers so you can play through multiple times. The new Scythe expansion, he's shown some more, it's a huge, lots of cool things in this expansion, it's the Wind Gambit. And they're, so they're making a legendary box, which is twice the size of Scythe, um, height-wise, and can fit everything. Who's asking for this sort of thing? I think two boxes is okay, I don't need a mega box, but I guess. WizKids has announced Dungeon Hustle, this is a game in which you're moving along a path, it looks like a push your luck style game, which is cool. And Lancelot, in which you are trying to win the heart of uh, I, the King of the Queen, actually, I don't know much more about that, but I like the idea of this game. Um, the Ares has announced an expansion for last Friday, Return to Camp Apache. This is going to let you play seven players in the game. And also, there's going to be, you can play as a demon or a, or a hunter. There's a lot of different variants that's going to add to this game. I didn't know the game did well enough to warrant an expansion, but I'm glad it did. It's a fun theme, even if I'm not a big fan of the game. Gale Force 9 has a game that's going to sell like hotcakes, Firefly Adventures, uh, Brigands and Browncoats, another Firefly game. The first Firefly game did really well. This one's a cooperative skirmish style game, so that looks like a lot of fun, right? Especially in that universe. Z-Man has announced yet another Reiner Knizia reprint, Through the Desert. I'm super pleased about this, though, because Through the Desert is an amazing abstract stra strategy style game. If you've never played it, you certainly should try it out. It is a lot of fun. This is a small note, but Finca has been announced to be reprinted by Franholz Spielverlag um, in multiple languages. That's all the information I know. Uh, but Finca was the rights for, for, for Crash Games. Crash Games, well, for lack of better terms, crashed. Uh, they're out of business, so it's good to see the rights for this game coming back. Ares and Phalanx have announced a distribution agreement. So Phalanx, probably best known for the, the game, I think, here, Hannibal Rome vs. Carthage. So you will be seeing Ares bring that to the North American market. 
Looney Labs is having some uh, uh, surveys on Zendo, which is coming out late this year, or early next year. Zendo is amazing. These pieces look phenomenal. I had a chance to play the new Zendo on a Dice Tower Cruise last year, and it was a lot of fun. A new expansion for Dominion, Nocturna. This is going to add 500 new cards, and some cards you can play after the buy phase. So that's something new and unusual. It looks like it's adding going to add some more complex mechanics. So if you thought Dominion was too simple, maybe you will like this expansion. Lots of cards in it, too. And a company called Super Meeple has announced Amon Ray the card game. All right, well, there's a lot of these big board games that have card games made. Will this one be any good? We will find out. That, folks, is all the regular news. It's time now to go over to the lovely Suzanne for our Kickstarter news. Happy breakfast, everybody. Shipping, songs, and solo. We've got some hefty projects to look at today, so let's get going. From the publishers of Ave Roma comes a much lighter game, Sakura. Celebrating the flowering of the cherry tree, Sakura is mechanically simple as players must play two cards each turn that match the color of the previous card and be one higher or lower depending on the side of the yin-yang it's on. When you get stuck in a jam, there are five characters you can hire, each of whom provides a unique ability for the turn. When you cannot play a card, you have to take the stack of cards you couldn't play on, some of which will provide coins, while others will hit you with penalty points, and the player with the fewest penalties wins. A copy of Sakura takes a pledge of 20 euro. A Song of Fire and Ice is a massive tabletop miniatures game, not a board game, from Cool Mini or Not. Whether you're a fan of the books or show or both, you'll see the book's inspiration in the game that pits the Starks against the Lannisters in an epic battle modes. Gameplay is largely based on unit warfare using a tray system to maneuver that allows the game to include separate miniatures while maintaining cohesive units. The game also features non-combat units that influence the battle behind the scenes by adding special abilities and they impact the battlefield and the way the cards play. A Song of Fire and Ice features five different game modes, including an objective-based play, a long siege mode, secret objectives, and more. Of course, as a Simon game, Song of Fire and Ice contains over 100 beautiful miniatures with a bunch of unlocked stretch goals and campaign exclusives. A copy of this massive game takes a pledge of $150 plus shipping. Renegade is a cooperative deck building game designed by Ricky Royal. This cyberpunk themed game is set in a world overrun by supercomputers and a small group of renegade hackers must get into the system to take it down. Renegade features a set of different game objectives that get randomized, adding strategic gameplay variability as players use their cards to both attack the system directly and manipulate the modular board setup. Hack the network, upgrade cards, and infect the system with viruses, uplinks, and replicants, which can also be upgraded. Meanwhile, the computer attacks back with sparks that can be upgraded too, and if the board fills up with sparks, the renegades lose. Renegade can be played solo or with up to four players, and you can get a copy for a pledge of $39 plus shipping. Crabs is a game originally released in Japan by Mo Ideas, and it's being brought to a wider audience with Daily Magic games. In Crabs, players are trying to collect yummy crabs using drafting, hand management, and set collection. You'll be taking or trading crabs from a central pool, but you can also use those cards to upgrade your equipment. You'll be able to increase a crab's value and ultimately turn them in for points, which introduces a clever mechanism in which the value of what you turn in determines the crab card that you get to keep. Crabs is light and quick with a lot of actions to choose from, and it has cute little crab meeples. You can get a copy for a pledge of $16 plus shipping. Feudum, the Queen's Army, is an expansion to last year's massive Feudum. Queen's Army adds the Despotic Queen. Played by an Atoma AI, the Queen can be fought by players cooperatively, players can ally with the Queen against others, or she allows the game to be played solo. The game plays similarly to the base game, but as the Queen works to kill the Behemoth King and destroy the Rebels, her AI changes as the game changes through play, and she has more freedoms than the player, making her a difficult foe. Feudum the Queen's Army requires the base game to use, and it features fantastic art by Justin Schultz. You can get the Queen's Army for a pledge of $19 plus shipping, or if you need to grab the base game too, there are pledge levels that start at $79 for that. 
Mercury Games is bringing us a reprint of Container for its 10th anniversary. This is a heavier, both in gameplay and components, economic game that's been out of print and highly in demand for a while. The 10th anniversary edition has gone jumbo size with 7-inch ships and more detailed components throughout. Container is just one of those games that's impossible to summarize well in a minute, but it's very open as players have a lot of freedom of choice as they build factories and warehouses or focus on shipping goods and more. But the market is delicate and opaque since value varies between players and keeping on top of that is critical to victory. This campaign also offers the new Investment Bank add-on that introduces an AI that is controlled by players' bids and actions. A copy of the mammoth 10th anniversary edition of Container takes a pledge of 96 Canadian dollars. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hey, hey there, uh, Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, and I'll, I'll be with you in just a minute. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm having a problem with some of the office equipment here in my office, and I've been waiting on hold for nearly two and a half hours to get connected to someone in the support department. You know, this whole thing kind of reminds me of the few times that I've had to actually contact customer support for a board game that I've purchased. Fortunately, then, out of the several hundred games that have kind of come and gone through my collection over the past few years, only one has really actually required me to contact the publisher for customer assistance, Marvel Legendary. Unfortunately, this one game has required me to do it nearly three times. The first time was when I discovered half a dozen of the cards in my copy of the Secret Wars expansion were all stuck together as if they were packaged up before their ink had dried. However, I contacted Upper Deck's customer support about the issue and replacement cards were shipped out to me, hassle-free, within a business day. So, that was pretty cool. Until I got my copy of the Legendary Villains expansion, which suffered from a slightly different issue, which was that it was just missing the ten cards that make up the Asgardian Warrior Adversary group. But unfortunately, uh, you know, once again, replacement cards arrived in my mailbox shortly after sending a quick email to the publisher's customer service mailbox. And those two previous issues, though resolved relatively easily and quickly, led to a sense of dread and paranoia last week when I opened up my copy of the latest Marvel Legendary expansion featuring the X-Men, only to find that the four decks that it contained were numbered 1, 2, 3, and 3. Well, the overwhelming sense of panic that had started to set in only subsided after I had discovered a forum thread by someone else with the same apparent misprint. And that forum thread contained a post that confirmed that this was not, in fact, a misprint, but is, indeed, the intended numbering for the decks that are included in the box. Why would you do that? But even so, overall, I think I've still been pretty lucky with the infrequent number of times that I've needed to contact a game company for product support. But what about you? What percentage of games in your collection have required you to contact a publisher to replace broken or missing components? Let me know in the comments below, because it'll give me something to read while I continue to wait for the next available customer service representative. What's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, a lot of reviews. I reviewed a whole pile of games already that you're going to be seeing posted this week. Um, we, um, we're going to see a new Top 100 from Eric Summer. That's going to start this week. And, of course, lots of other reviews from the other people on our channel. I will continue my series, the Top 10 Games That Are Better Than, and pick some more mass market games. And these aren't to put those mass market games down. They're videos for you to give to your friends who might like a specific game. I think this week I'm doing Clue. So like for example, if they like Clue, you can say here. If you like Clue, these are other games you might like also. So I hope that you enjoy those. And of course, the Dice Tower audio show. Eric and I this week are talking about a mega game that we were part of and we'll go over that. Later on this week, if I have a chance, I will be also 
talking a little bit about Gen Con and some previewing of things that are coming out for that. And um, today, I'll be doing a live Q&A at some point. Haven't decided what time yet, so just keep an eye on our channel for that or watch our Twitter feed. All right, let's continue on. Remember, you can find all of this at DiceTowerNetwork.com. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Apply Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Port Royal. Now, Port Royal has an interesting press your luck mechanism that I want to go over. So let me show you a little bit about the game and why I like that game mechanism. Everyone is going to be dealt three coins from this deck of cards. Every card will represent coins if they're face down, or if they're face up, they'll represent either taxes, expeditions, people for hire, or even pirate ships. On your turn, you're simply going to draw a card and place it face up. You can draw as many cards as you want, and you can stop whenever you like. However, if you draw two matching pirate ships of the same color, then you bust and you get nothing. If you were to stop here, then you have options to choose from. You can either hire this character for 8 coins, which will give you a special ability and potential points, or you can decide to take two coins from the ship, in which case you'll just draw two cards and add it to your other coins that you have at hand. Once you've made your decision, then everyone else clockwise is going to decide if they also want to go ahead and hire or take the coin itself. If they decide to hire this governor, they can go ahead and hire him for eight coins and pay you a coin because it's out of their turn. The game ends once someone has collected 12 points. So as you can see in Port Royale, there's the drawing of the card where one person is just drawing a card at a time, trying to get coins or hire new people and avoiding pirates. However, everyone at the table is also interested in that card draw. Because the more cards you draw, the more options they will also have to acquire new things themselves. So you have people that are also egging you on to keep on drawing cards, so it's not just a one-person thing, but the whole table is pretty much pressing their lucks with your turn. So that's what I really enjoy about Port Royale, because it makes it fun and interesting for the whole table. Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Hey man, hey man, what's up? What are you doing? What are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? You wanna play a game? What time wanna play a game? Look at my hair. What are you doing, yeah. man? It's like two in the morning. Yeah, perfect time. You got nothing else to do. What are you gonna do right now? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna go to the gym? What are you gonna go to the gym? What are you gonna do? You gonna eat some eat some pot stickers? That's what you gonna do? Come on, play no, some games. Look, look. This board game stuff's getting out of hand. You know I love it, dude, but I think you're full-blown addicted to board games, bro. Yeah, good problem to have, right? Need more games. Need more games. Does this seem like normal behavior? Yeah. Look at these forearms. You know how hard I can flick with this? Look at this. Look at right here. Bam! There you go. I think there's only one thing we can do, man. I hate to be harsh, but we're going to have to go cold turkey. What are you talking about? I can't go cold turkey. What am I supposed to stop, stop playing games? What am I supposed to do with my life? No. You don't have to stop playing games, I just, we're gonna play the game cold turkey over and over again, and it's gonna break your love of board games forever. I really think it'll help. Yeah, it's awful. Good for the review, though. Who are you talking to? Huh? Uh, hey man, let's, let's play cold turkey! Huh? Yeah! Okay, so this is Cold Turkey. This is going to be a game in which I'm going to be trying to get my colored cubes into my colored tray before all the other players can get their cubes in. When I turn this turkey on, he's going to start ska kicking all these cubes out, and I'm going to try to grab mine as they come out here out of the pond and throw other people's cubes in. And it goes a little bit like this. So I'm just waiting for one of mine. I can take that and throw it back in there. I can throw that in, and we just keep going until someone fills their tray or until we get a migraine from the sound. So that was... Cold turkey. It's not annoying at all. When I was looking up stuff about this game, the first thing on Board Game Geek says no sane parent would ever buy this game for their kids. And I love the 90s so much. And the best thing I love about it is the advertising from that era. Check out this commercial real quick. No turkey. No. Pizza Do check us out on the social media, you guys. What was your favorite oh, commercial? Way. Tweet us your favorite commercial. And until next time, we'll see you at the thrift store. We'll see you there. He seriously is so sick.
I'm so sick. I'm so sorry. I'm at 103 fever. Cr for like crazy hallucinating right now. <laughs> Half the segment, he thought that I was this guy. <laughs> too many or not too many? That is the question. Hi, I'm Chris Renshaw from the Boards and Swords podcast, and welcome to Role Playing. When describing something as complex as combat in a role-playing game, sometimes it's helpful to have visual aids. And that's why a lot of times you'll see people use minis in the role-playing games. They'll have a mini for each one of your player characters, and you'll have a mini for each bad guy that you're, or zombie in this case, that you're fighting up against and you'll display them out either you'll have some sort of mat or maybe you have dungeon tiles or terrain or something to represent your battlefield in this case but for some people that's just not their thing either they don't want to invest in minis and terrain and boards or whatever or maybe you don't want to carry all that stuff everywhere you go that you want to play a role-playing game you just want to be able to have some books and then boom you've got a game. So there's also another option. It's a really weird term, but it's called theater of the mind. And that's where the entire battle takes place up in here. And you just describe in words and in relations to the other characters, be like, oh, well, there's a tree over there and I'm going to, my character's gonna work their way behind the tree and trying to wait for a good position until one of the zombies comes by and then get in a knife attack. So what kind of combat do you like to see in your role-playing games? Do you prefer having minis where you can lay out and describe what you're doing? Or do you prefer a more narrative description, the theater of the mind style of play? Let me know down in the comments below. And until next time, may all your hits be crits. Hello. In this video, I'll be talking about decks or cards. Cards. When playing a card game, you have certain words that you might not be familiar with. You have a draw deck, a hand, and a discard pile. All of those things has one thing in common, and that is cards. And this is from Love Letter. Sometimes you are asked to look at the hand of a player. They don't mean the physical hand, but rather the cards in them, or the face of the card. So each card has two sides. You have the back side, which has a similar graphics. And you have the front side, with the actual content of the card and what it does. But then you also have cards that are hidden from yourself, and that is called the draw pile. Now, here's a stack of cards, they all have the same backside up, and you normally shuffle this, and then you draw from them, and put it on your hand. So now you have the clear side to look at the card, and once it's played, it goes in the discard pile. And when it's in a discard pile, it's usually unavailable for further uh, use in the game. A simple example of this is Love Letter. You have one card in your hand, and then you draw another one on your turn, and you play one of those, and you play it directly to your discard pile. So at that moment, it does something, but later in the game, it doesn't do anything. It's just wasted or discarded, used. There you go, we have a draw deck, a hand of cards, discard pile, and the front or facing, and the back of the cards. Uh, I'm going to try to be more regular about this again. Uh, things are kind of uh, prioritizing different now with a new addition to the family, so I'm focusing more on that, and, and board games come later. Okay, see ya! When I was a child, I spoke as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. That phrase has been quoted to me before, and it's been quoted to a lot of us, especially when it comes in regards to board games. But uh, specifically, um, every once in a while, I see someone make a comment and be like, Tom just likes to play with plastic toys. And that's why he likes these games better than games without plastic or wood and stuff. Which is honestly a garbage statement, because if you look at my top 10 games, there are several games in there that have no plastic at all. And there are games that have lots of great plastic, which I have eviscerated in my review. But be that as it may. Why am I beating around the bush on this, though? What does it matter? You know, I always find it kind of funny when someone's like, ah, oh, you just like to play your plastic toys. Yeah, I do. And I don't care what you think about it. You know, uh, many years ago, I, did, I got a job uh, in, in Korea. I was uh, elected pastor of my church there. And when that happened, I had a lot of crazy ties. And I said to my wife, 
I need to get rid of some of these crazy ties. I need to look the part. Let's get some normal ties. And I went out and bought some normal looking shirts and things. And I did that and I did that for a few years and I was extremely unhappy because I was wearing and doing things on a perception level basis. And you know, I get comments about my hats a lot and people are like, ah, what a dumb hat. Or I wear crazy socks, you can't see them on video, but I do. And people make fun of those. And there was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I was like, yeah, I just don't care. I'll wear the hats I want. I'll wear the socks I want because they make me happy and they're fun to do. And why should I let someone else sneering at my fun ruin it? So the same thing comes with miniatures and games. They're plastic toys. Yay! I'm so happy about that. That's fun for me. And you can't belittle my fun by sitting there moving around cubes, which I just want you to know is still a toy. Okay, just because your game has shares and stocks and paper money and cubes and things doesn't make it any less of a toy than mine. Yours isn't any more accepted by the general public than mine is. So why would I care? So if someone says, Tom likes this game because it's full of plastic miniatures, <laughs> yes. You are absolutely straight on with that one. Because I do. Memoir 44 is fun with miniatures. Would it be fun without miniatures? Sure, but it's more fun. Little plastic soldiers. I like playing with them. I like Blood Rage, the cool different miniatures that are in it. I don't have to have miniatures in a game for it to be fun. There's lots of other things. But I'm never going to let someone be like, oh, well, you just like toys. <laughs> I will. And of course, we all make fun of each other's stuff here, especially in a dice tower. You'll see us mock each other. Oh, you like that because of this and that. And that's all in good fun. But there's a lot of people online who say these things and they're not in good fun. And it's like a put down. And if you have more fun being a boring adult than myself, go for it. The verse that says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. And when I became an adult, I put away childish things. has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with not having fun as an adult. And I am getting more serious as I get older. I think that's just a natural thing, but I don't want to lose that spark of fun that I had when I was a kid. Are you kidding? Bring on the plastic. Hey everyone, it's lunchtime. Today we're going to be looking at New York Sliced. It's designed by Jeffrey D. Allers, published by Bezier Games. It plays two to six players ages eight and up in about 30 minutes. Okay, so let's get to some pizza. Pizza. So basically what's gonna happen is in the game, we're trying to get branches of the pizza that get us a lot of points. There are different types of pizza in the game. There's some with pepperoni. There's some with the anchovies. Ooh, nobody likes those because they're minus points. The pepperoni is great because we can actually use those as points if we turn them upside down. We'll talk about that shortly. We also have veggies, which have no pepperoni, unfortunately, but they do have a little number on there. So that can also get us points. Basically what's happening is we want to have the majority of a number and then that will score us that point value. So for example, if I had multiples of tens and I was the winner of the tens, I would get 10 points, the other player would get zero. So we want to be in the winner of that number. So to start the game, someone's going to be designated the slicer, this girl right here. And uh, we're playing with three of us, so I would want to split this up into three sections. They don't have to be equal, but we want to keep in mind that we're trying not to give away points. So keep that in mind while you're splitting them up. Then once we've done that, we have the these are like the today's specials, if I'm not mistaken. And these we can actually play as a separate piece, or we can actually keep our separate piles and add this to one of the other sections. So the slicer, unfortunately, would choose less. So Tracy would decide to choose, and then Stefan. And then Where's the Hawaiian? Where's the Hawaiian? <laughs> Tracy took the Hawaiian. And then I would get whatever's left over. So from there, you can actually put this into your pizza area, or if you decide, hey, I just want the points, I can decide to flip a pizza like this over, and then I would get two points because it has two pepperoni slices at the end of the game. If you have any negative things showing, like my fans, anchovies, oh, those are going to be negative points at the end of the game. You can't flip them over, unfortunately, so you'll have to take the hit. These little today special tokens are great because they have little effects that you can use either at the beginning, during the game, and some of them are also at end game scoring. Uh, I think I covered it all. Yes, and uh, honestly, you need to have a pizza shop near your work because <laughs> you're going to want to eat pizza when you play this game. Every time I've been craving pizza after. But it's just so thematic across the board. Like this is the this is the rule book. It actually opens like um, like a restaurant menu, and it's so fantastic. So that is just I just love how they really paid attention to the detail. Fantastic game, and it has Hawaiian in it, so that makes oh. me happy. <laughs> we won't talk about that. Hawaiian rules. <laughs> that's as good as the anchovies. Okay, so I think that's it for now. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.
Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. We're just past the halfway part of the year of 2017, right before the two major game conferences of Gen Con and Essen. I thought this would be a great time to talk about my top solo games from the first half of 2017. At number five, we've got Flip Ships, a dexterity game that's really can be thought of as Space Invaders, the card game or the board game. You're flicking these discs that represent ships at cards that represent aliens. Ton of fun and dexterity games aren't usually my favorite. Number four, Tiny Epic Quest. It's a brand new game. It honestly may go higher on my list the more I play it, but it has a Zelda feel from the art, if not from the gameplay. A really nice game where the first half you're trying to maneuver yourself on a board, and in the second half of each turn you're rolling dice in a push your luck fashion to try to complete quests. A lot of fun. At number three, Outlive. A game with a post-apocalyptic setting. It's a worker placement resource management game and it's almost like Fallout Shelter as a board game. A lot of fun. A little more deep and meaty than some of the other games, but I really do like it. At number two, Quests of Valeria. One of the Valeria series of games that I've liked so much. This game is super quick to set up, super quick to play and tear down. A whole lot of fun in a small box. Quests of Valeria. And finally, my number one favorite solo board game for the first half of 2017, Mass Mora, Dungeons of Arcadia, set in the Arcadia Quest universe. It is a dice-chucking dungeon crawler. Not always my favorite type of game, but for some reason this game is just a lot of fun to me. It, uh, it can be played competitively, cooperatively, or solo, and all three are a lot of fun. So there you have it, my top five board games from the first half of 2017. What are some of your favorite games of the year so far? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much, and have a great day. On this episode, I was asked to tag in to answer a request for a medium weight family game. So let's go and see what we got. Hi, I'm Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and this is What Should I Get, where we basically go on the board game subreddit and look under the daily personalized game recommendations that's posted on a daily basis, and we recommend games for people. So, let's go ahead and start. The Weasel 27 is basically looking for a medium weight family game that can hold up for three to eight players that plays in under an hour. Just like I said in the intro, my name is Dis, requested me to answer this one, and I noticed that he requested a couple games, and those games were Dead of Winter and Arcadia Quest. Now, two problems with that, with Dead of Winter, that game is a little bit long I've never played that game in under two hours it only handles up to five players and the only problem with Arcadia Quest is that it's actually pretty good fit except the only problem with it is that it only plays up to four players. Room 25 Ultimate Edition is literally the cube of the game it's a great little social deduction ish kind of game where you're trying to do programs and management to get out of a maze while at the same time there's one to two players trying to prevent them and destroy all the other players. And just like I said in other episodes Seven Wonders and Between Two Cities are pretty good fit for this only issues with it is that they might be on a little bit on the lights Side, but with expansions I could fix that and also they only go up to seven players now another great game for this category would be spheres of influence it goes from two to eight players and not only that it's basically risk but way better it handles eight players perfectly and I'd say a normal game is 90 minutes or under now another game I would suggest would be escape from aliens in outer space now what makes this game so great is that it's a hidden movement game but everyone's doing the hidden movement there's two teams, there's an alien team and a human team. The aliens are trying to defeat the humans and the humans are trying to escape out of the maze. And the last game I'm gonna suggest with a little bit of an asterisk attached to it is gonna be Unlock the Island of Dr. Gorse or Goose, or whatever. Now with this game, to be honest, I'm not sure if I hate this game or if I was just playing with the wrong people. I would suggest checking it out. It's one of the few escape room kind of games or even puzzle games in general where it actually plays better with more players. I would almost suggest not playing it with the under six players. Just bear in mind, there's no real spoilers in this, but there's gonna be two separate rooms of people trying to solve this problem. And if one room gets stuck and the other room's perfectly fine, that's where the problems come in, just so you know. And that was another episode of What Should I be sure to post your questions on the board game subreddit underneath the daily personalized game recommendations segment that's posted there on a daily basis. And I'm Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and I hope you're enjoying breakfast. Yes, today we are going down under 
my favorite part on this and that for Beeren Park. My name is Niels Cyril's Brettspiel, and now let's jump into my favorite part of Beeren Park. You see, I'm full of energy. My favorite part of Beeren Park, this cute little game from Phil Walker Harding, is it is so much fun. It's such a feel good game when you play that uh, these tiles here. You're always trying to puzzle to what is the perfect move for me. Should should I do this or leave one spot here? And then you have this additional go kart experience uh, expert variant but you should play it with that so it's so rewarding it's such a great game it makes so much fun to puzzle around it's like build your own bear park with cute little bears brilliant it feels so good oh gosh is that good i really wanted to play it right now um, the only thing that I don't want you to do is set up the board. Set up the board, even if it looks all organized and every uh, thing has a spot here, as you can see the cross here or this ice bear uh, thing here. But you also have set the, these here in order because they are worth seven, six, five, four, three, two, one points. So you do this with this tile, this, this, this. You set up these ones. You sort all of the finished statue tokens in or uh, in a numerical order so they even if it doesn't look like they are so much set up so set up really sucks it's a little bit like, like Karuba the same feeling of Karuba you have a short game of half hour or Karuba is even shorter and you use set up for 10 minutes so oh gosh holy but other than that who is that good Phil great game and I'm trying to save the energy for Beeren Park. I will play it right now. So see you next week when I played a couple of more times Beeren Park here on the Board Game Breakfast. And enjoy it. Enjoy the rest of the show. Bye bye. All right, folks, it's time to take a look at the shelves this week. Here we have a great, great party game. Word on the street. Mine's all beat up but it is still a fantastic team word game. Baron Park just got this one. Really like the tile building game. Viticulture, one of the greatest games of all time. Has the Tuscany expansion inside it. Really great. Veggie Garden, I enjoy this short, simple game from QSF. Of course, it's simple. Compounded, this is a fun game with a great theme. And Blood Bowl Team Manager, a game you don't hear talked about very much, but a really fun, it's almost like a variation on war, but they did a really good job at bringing a Blood Bowl theme into it. When I Dream, a great party game. Lost Cities, here's my two-player list. Lost Cities, Thunder and Lightning, Targi, Starship, Catan, Asante, which includes Jumbo inside it, and Heave Ho. Now these top, one, two, three, four, five. These five are probably my five favorite of this series. These are just great games. Heave Ho is not as good, but it's such silly fun and can be played with kids that I keep it. Um, this is a great trading game. Targi's a great worker placement game. Thunder and Lightning, Stratego as cards. Lost Cities, of course, is fantastic. Starship, Catan, a two-player trading game, too. Splendor, of course, is here. Nuns in the Run is here. I'm not as big of a fan of Nuns in the Run as Melody is, but she is, which is why it is still on the shelf. Folks, that's what's on the shelf this week. House rules. That's a thing people feel ways about, like love or being stabbed in the eye with a pencil. A rule we use is often referred to as a Care Bear rule, where if you're trying to build an efficiency engine, you just don't use the mean cards. Like at the gates of Loyang, we just take those mean cards right out. I mean, I like mindless violence as much as the next guy, but take that cards in games where I'm trying to build something, suck. Now, the thing with house rules is that some people kind of think they're cheating. The most common house rule in my house goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got six cards, but this card says I can draw back up to a seven, but I've got to discard four cards now, and then with this card, I can not discard th the ones that I'm th at the start of the round where you meant, you know, where you. Uh, wait. What? With stuff like that, we use something that we call the consensus rule, where as long as everyone does the same thing each time, rightly or wrongly, it's kind of okay. And though yes, playing like that probably does break the game in a way a very smart person might be able to tell you. But I'll tell you what, it's a lot quicker 
than spending two hours searching board game geek or essentially emailing the designer. Though when rules are ambiguous, I think everyone's guilty of this. Yeah, I, th I think I'm reading this right. Basically, it's this is only going to benefit me and everybody else doesn't get to do that. I mean, although it's not worded quite like that, basically, I think I get points. But we all do it. I'll see you next week. Hi everybody, welcome to War and Pieces. It's great to be back here on Board Game Breakfast. Now if you're wondering where Miniature World, it went back to its home, which is originally Throw Punch Lunch. It's more of a miniature segment, so that's where it belongs on Throw Punch Lunch. As far as painting and stuff like that, well, I'm back on the Mighty DT doing the, our painting segments. Well, we're going to be doing them every other week. And the first one that you're going to see is Adrenaline. But for this segment that we have the two minutes for, we're going to be talking about Ward Games. We're going to be talking about Ward Games past, present, and future. And we're going to talk about how Ward Gaming has evolved and how it's kind of dying and needs some saving. Now, next week's segment is going to be pretty interesting, and I want you to keep this in mind because we're going to be gearing up for Gen Con, and we're going to be talking about the top five war games that will be coming out at Gen Con that I'll be looking forward to. So I look forward to doing this each and every week with you. War and Pieces, I'm excited to get going with it. Until next time, I'm Rob Born. We will see you soon. If you run a board game cafe, or you just have some friends who aren't really gamers, then odds are some of your games are too complicated for your customers or your friends. So today on How to Snakes, we tackle one possible solution on how to deal with games that are overly complicated. Some games are complicated with good reason. Other games, however, they have just one or two little additions, components, or rules that make the game tricky to learn or fiddly to play just enough that they are going to scare off a lot of potential players who would otherwise really, really enjoy those games. When we find one of those games, we like to edit it. If we can, we remove that component or remove that rule to make the game easier to learn and more accessible for everybody. In part two of the teaching, I talked about Carcassonne's fields and how you can leave them out of your initial teach with a group of people and bring it back in if they decide they want to play it again. Another great game for staggered teaches is Pit. It is a blast to play without the bull and the bear cards, and so that's the way we teach it to most people. Now, if a table is enjoying it so much that they play it two or three times in a row, that's when we will suggest that they learn how to play the full game with the bull and the bear involved. Lots of games do this on their own. They have components or rules that they recommend as advanced. Things like Quarto, Dead Man's Draw, Flashpoint, uh, Cash and Guns. So what we do is we will edit out those advanced components and only keep them in the box if we feel that they are absolutely the best and only way to play that game. Some party games get components axed from them completely to make them better for our particular cafe environment. Cranium, for example, has a Play-Doh-like substance that you use for their Sculptor Aids challenges. We have removed all the Sculptor Aids cards and the sculpting dough because at the rate our games get played, that dough gets really unusable really quickly. Now some games, like the Resistance, come with components that we remove because we think that without them, the game actually plays a little better. Which components are those? The voting tokens. Sure, some people like the secret voting, but in our experience, the game is more fun and more interesting when you can actually see how players have voted, and you can use that information to decide who's going on the next team or how you want to vote for the next team. We just give a thumbs up for a yes, a thumbs down for a no. Editing out game components also means that the setup and the teardown goes a lot quicker, which is very handy in the cafe environment. And it means that we have fewer pieces to lose, which is a huge deal. So, do you have components that you leave out when you're teaching a game to people for the first time? Or do you have components that you just leave out entirely? Tell us about it in the comments below.
that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks, guys, for sticking around another week. I'm really excited. There's some cool things coming out from the Dice Tower, but we're not announcing them to Gen Con, and that will be next Friday. If you haven't signed up for that event, I think there's only 80 tickets left out of 1,200. Um, so you might want to get one of those while you can. Hey, folks, I'll see you later on today at the live Q&A. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thank you to my contributors for the amazing things they've done. And I'm Tom Bassel, and this has been Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.